Hello and welcome to Economic Divide with me, Kaveh Tahwe. In this week's show, we will be looking at Russia and how the recent tensions with the EU have pushed Russia east towards China. The Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said we're ready for that in reference to Russia breaking ties with the EU. He even said, if you want peace, prepare for war. The consequence for the, this type of approach, well, it risks the Russian economy to go downwards, including in the most sensitive areas. Since the annexation of Crimea in 2014, EU economic sanctions have targeted Russia's financial, defense, and energy sectors. Russia has responded with counter-sanctions, banning around half of its agri-food imports from the bloc. Well, EU leaders unanimously decided to extend the sanctions until the 31st of July, 2021. The measures, which are renewed twice a year, have hit Russia hard. By late 2018, its economy was thought to be 6% lower in terms of its GDP output due to EU and US sanctions. Let's now look into our first report that studies the trade relation between the EU and Russia and how Russia does not need to look towards Europe for economic connectivity and new ideas. Warning was a severe one. Russia warned the EU that it would cut ties over economic sanctions. Russia accused the EU that three of its diplomats had attended an illegal pro Navalny protest. Russia's opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has been a vocal critic of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and the EU has slammed Russia for jailing him. And for the first time last week on Monday, we decided to implement sanctions because of the Navalny case. It means that we are totally committed and we are united uh, in Europe in order to be very tough, very firm, in order to promote our values, to defend uh, our uh, interests. Well, obviously, um, uh, this represents a very serious escalation in tensions between Russia and the European Union. And the backdrop to all of this is, of course, the pandemic uh, and the massive economic and social and political strain that's putting both on Russia and upon the European Union. Now, of course, EU leaders say that this is about Navalny uh, in Russia and the crackdown on uh, democratic dissent and so on. Um, I think most people can see that this is hypocritical. Russia-EU trade relations will surely deteriorate even further now that both will trade sanctions. But how low can this relationship go? The European Union and Russia have an important bilateral trade relation. Russia is the EU's fifth largest trading partner, and the EU is Russia's largest trading partner. The trade value between the two is valued at 232 billion euros for the year 2019. In 2019, Russia was the origin of 40% of EU imports of gas and 27% of EU imports of oil. Due to the large value of these imports, EU's trade deficit with Russia is only second to EU's trade deficit with China. Taking a look at imports and exports, the main EU exports to Russia are in the categories of machinery, transport equipment, medicines, chemicals, and other manufactured products. Meanwhile, the main EU imports from Russia are raw materials, especially oil like crude and refined gas, as well as metals, notably iron, steel, aluminum, and nickel. Joining me in the studio is current affairs and impact analyst Mahan Abedin. We also have Mark Sloboda, a Moscow-based international affairs and security analyst. He provides security and geopolitical analysis to various media outlets and as a political risk consultant, he also operates in that capacity. Okay, I'd like to welcome you both. Mark Sloboda, first to you. Russia heading for a break is what the news says with the EU. The Russian foreign minister, uh, his quote, we're ready for that. If you want peace, prepare for war. He said that a break in ties could be triggered by EU sanctions and that uh, will create risk for the Russian economy, including in the most sensitive areas. What does this mean when it comes to the economies of both Russia and the EU and the impact of this break uh, were it to occur? Okay, so uh, Lavrov's comments about a, the potential for a break with the EU come in the context of the EU discussing new sanctions, uh, an yet another sanctions pact to level against Russia uh, over the affair with uh, the fringe far-right 
uh, Russian ultranationalist Alexei Navalny, who is, is pretty much openly supported by Western media and intelligence services. Russia draws a severe difference between the EU and the individual member states uh, of the EU in Europe. Okay, it sounds an awful lot like uh, what Trump used to say about the EU and the individual countries. Well, Mahan, relations between the EU and Russia are at a low, another low. Um, and you have sanctions that have been exercised, uh, the case of Navalny basically being the push there. It seems there's no escaping it that uh, the sanctions is bringing Russia to a point where it needs to decide how it's going to still be bound to the sphere of the EU in terms of trade, for example. Does the EU, given how badly it's in need of an economic boost with the way that it's suffering from the COVID-19 mm -hmm. cumulatively, can it afford to actually lose a trading partner like Russia? Well, in, in short, no, because the EU is undergoing tremendous problems. I mean, Brexit is one of them, the UK leaving. The UK was a huge part of the EU, especially from a defence and security point of view. It was really the only country that had weight and punch on the international stage. France accepting, perhaps. So there's the UK issue, there's schisms and its own centrifugal forces. Look, this vaccination rollout is a prime example of how the EU cannot cope with a major crisis. Thank you for that. Um, now uh, we're going to take a look at the next report that's uh, coming up, uh, which in this case is going to focus on the way uh, that the uh, EU uh, has been doing uh, with respect to Russia, uh, of how uh, Russia is actually being pushed into uh, perhaps China, China's side, but uh, how at the same time can brings about the question how Russia, whether Russia can actually lose the EU as a trading partner. We'll also examine the U.S. role in the way that it's demonized Russia to stop a close EU trade link with Russia. Vladimir Putin unmasked. Shock claim Kremlin will do anything to break up the EU. Headlines similar to this have made the rounds in the news. But why would the Russian President Vladimir Putin want the breakup of the EU? Take this entry by the BBC, which paints a picture that Vladimir Putin is using hybrid warfare to destabilize Europe. Is Vladimir Putin using hybrid warfare to destabilize the EU? Hybrid warfare can refer to any form of aggression short of open invasion. From the perspective of the EU, what they are fundamentally worried about is the breakdown of what used to be called the unipolar world. So a world where the United States was overwhelmingly uh, hegemonic, both in economic and military terms. And likewise, its allies, uh, like the European Union bloc, um, were, you know, the only show in town uh, when it came to, to global geopolitics. Clarify matters, Russia has said that it wants closer ties with friendly EU states. But when it comes to the EU and Russia, it's all about trade. On the one hand, Russia does not want to be bound to the EU's bloc's trading rules. Yet it does want to trade with EU countries where its interests are concerned. But it is the US that has played a factor in forming an anti-Russia stance, dragging the EU along with it. The perfect opportunity presented itself with the 2014 Russian annexation of Crimea and Moscow's role in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Back with me in the studio is Mohan Abedin and Mark Sloboda. Welcome back. Thank you. Mark Sloboda, Russia not too keen on the European Union. It has said that. It is part of the Eurasian Economic Union at the same time, which may be somewhat of a competition. The prospect of closer ties, however, between Moscow and Beijing has worried many analysts in the U.S. and also the EU. Uh, a new poll has found Russians are far more actually upbeat about their um, eastern neighbors than those to their west. Is Russia more gravitated economically, you think, to the east, or does it want to find a fine balance between the two when it comes to trade? Yeah, so I, th I think that requires some specification. Russia, I agree, is not keen on the EU as an institution, but it still is trying and hopes 
for better relations with the individual member states uh, of Europe that are that are part of the EU. You know, principally Germany, France, uh, you know, but others as well. Um, and China is r still Russia's largest state trading partner by a significant amount with, with trade uh, in, in the last year uh, between the two totaling some 50 billion uh, in US dollar terms. Um, but um, collectively, if you view the, the countries of Europe uh, as one within the EU, then that biggest trading partner would still be the EU. So Russia still does do significant uh, trade with the EU and is, or the, its members and is loath uh, to see these relations uh, further damaged, uh, particularly on economic terms. Well, um, it appears that there is a, a difference here in the figures that has been presented. Uh, it is now said that Russia, Mohan, is actually uh, doing more trade with China, upwards to around 100 billion is what is projected mm -hmm. for this current year that we're in. Uh, so uh, that would put China to be the number one partner. However, uh, let's take a look at the foreign policy of the EU and the West. I don't know if you agree with this, in particular when I say West, the US, uh, whether that has prevented from the two forging ties with Russia. In other words, you have the EU and the US maybe on one mm -hmm. side, and since they're aligned, so to speak, when mm -hmm. it comes to their approach to Russia, that perhaps then that together combined, mm -hmm. they, they may be uh, then imposing restrictions, i.e. sanctions mm -hmm. onto Russia. Do you think there's an alignment there and this China-Russia alliance, mm -hmm. do you think will further then uh, be forged closer as you get the US and the EU on, uh, on one corner? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, on the issue of trade, uh, you're right, China is a, is a huge trading partner for Russia, but the quality of trade is important too. It's Russia's energy supplies, its gas, for instance, is mostly going to the EU, and that's very, very important. Thanks to both Mohan and Mark Sloboda. Right now, we're about to take a short break here on Economic Divide, but don't go anywhere, as we have plenty more coming up after these short messages. So stay right where you are. Welcome back to Economic Divide with me, Kabatahwai. Time now to take a look at some of the other economic headlines hitting the front pages in our info news section. Now, this piece of news got our attention first. Farmers and Rights Group boycott food, summit over big business links. The focus said it was on agro-business rather than ecology, which is split groups invited to the planned UN conference on hunger. One of the big businesses, for example, is funded by Bill Gates. The farmers don't want things like precision agriculture, data collection, and genetic engineering to be executed in the farming practices, because that could hurt, hurt their bottom line. Now moving on to news related to COVID, this got our attention. Drug lobby asking Biden to punish foreign countries who are pushing for low cost vaccines. Now Big Pharma is fighting for tight control over the COVID-19 vaccine production. In turn, it limits availability worldwide while reaping billions. Well, this definitely doesn't sound fair for the poorer countries that can't afford the high price of the vaccine, which would prolong the disease and thus negatively affect their economies. Okay, the U.S. recently passed the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Well, that may sound good, but there are several drawbacks. I mean, if you're 25, for example, the new plan will strap you with $1,750 in annual interest by the time you reach 35. And in terms of the U.S. debt, Although it surged by $7 trillion under Trump, as you can see over here, it's going to go much higher under Biden, the national U.S. debt, before the stimulus stood at $27.9 trillion. And finally, what is going on with the oil prices? Well, it seems that global oil demand is set to benefit from stronger economic recovery and vaccinations in the second half of this year. That's according to OPEC, of course. As OPEC goes, production has been cut, which drives up the prices. Currently, the price of rent crude is almost $70 a barrel, which is quite amazing when you think that less than a year ago, oil prices fell below zero. Okay, time now to take a look at our final report of the show, which looks at the ways that China and Russia have aligned themselves to the point where it is highly inconceivable how the U.S. can actually catch up to these two superpowers.
The Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Russian President Vladimir Putin have put economics at the center of their strategic partnership, the key pillar of their relationship. The relationship has reached a point that each has called each other the most important economic partner. Multiple projects in the pipeline, literally. Take this gas project, which connects Russia to China. I think this is a, a major concern for the European Union and the West. What they are concerned about is the rise of China, uh, which has been a major focus of Western discontent during the pandemic period. Uh, and the decline of what was once called the, the unipolar world, that is the United States, its massive uh, economic and military and diplomatic influence in the world, also bolstered, of course, by its allies uh, in the European Union, principally in Britain and, and so forth. Um, so I think that they are worried that that iron grip is loosening under the conditions of the pandemic. Moscow and Beijing have also gone ahead to use their own national currencies more often in trade, as Russia's relations with the West deteriorate even further. The Russian president has also repeated how the role of the dollar should be revisited in global trade. Очевидно, что эти глубокие перемены требуют адаптации международных финансовых организаций, переосмысления роли доллара, который, став мировой резервной валютой, превратился сегодня в инструмент давления страны эмитента на весь остальной мир. Even Xi and Putin's signature economic visions appear complementary at first glance. Xi's Belt and Road Initiative has unleashed Chinese companies to build roads, railways, fiber optic cables, and other hard infrastructures across the Eurasian supercontinent and beyond. Everyone's heard of the European Union, but what you may not know is that the largest economic union in the world, geographically at least, is actually right next door. Meanwhile, Putin's Eurasian Economic Union harmonizes customs processes to create a single market among Russia, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. And none of this comes as a surprise. The U.S. under the former President Trump targeted China in a trade war. Washington and Russia were also placed under Western sanctions. And they are probably worried that Russia uh, might grow closer to China at a time when China, of course, is really the, the rising power um, across Asia. So Russia has, you know, economic interests east and west. What they are worried about is the balance uh, in that influence and that Russia will become a more serious competitor to the European Union and the West. This is what's haunting them. It's not a serious concern for the democratic rights of the Russian people. I'm pleased to welcome back one more time current affairs and impact analyst Mahan Abedin and Mark Sloboda. Okay, Mark, final question to you. Russia's economic ties with China have elevated both to such a level uh, that some are saying that it may prevent the U.S.'s economic advancement. Particularly, we can look at the way that Russia has advanced. This way, maybe pushing the U.S. down the economic ladder. I mean, we have seen how China is set to overtake the U.S. economy by the year 2034, which was revised to 2028. Uh, do you think rich, source, rich Russia and China together will be able to actually do that? Yeah, uh, so first of all, I mean, this has been an, a, a geo-economic truth for decades now, that the neoliberal global um, economic architecture that the U.S. has set up over the decades, uh, beginning with Bretton Woods all the way uh, up, up through, uh, you know, up to the, the last successful rounds of the, of the World Trade Organization, the creation of the IMF, uh, uh, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, and, and uh, other ways that the U.S. Uh, has leverage over the global financial system. This has actually 
resulted through the processes of globalization and capital seeking cheaper uh, labor for production in a global shift in wealth and economic power away from the United States uh, and towards the East, in, per in particular uh, China uh, and, and, and more generally in Asia. Mohan Abedin, Current Affairs and Impact Analyst, thank you so much for your thoughts. You're welcome. Okay, uh, time now for a thousand words. Taking a look at trade between the EU and Russia. As an example, January through March 2020, the turnover between the Russia and the European Union decreased by 10.1% year on year, which was down to 52.3 billion euros. This table over here shows the first quarter of each year from the year 2018, moving on to 2019 and 2020. This here is are the trade flows going from the EU to the Russian Federation and over there from the Russian Federation or Russia to the EU. Now, your countries, well, uh, they had an increase uh, by 4.6% in Q1 2020, which made for about 20.6 billion euros, exports from Russia to the EU declining by 17.7%, which is down to 31.7 billion euros. Bad news then, right? Wrong. Uh, this is actually what has happened. Now, five years ago, the Russian economy was teetering on the brink. Following Moscow's invasion and the annexation of Crimea in March 2014, where some countries imposed powerful economic sanctions on Russia, which coupled with a steep decline in the price of oil, could have brought the Kremlin to its knees. Let's move on to the next graph uh, so we can talk about it. Here, this is from the Financial Times. By many metrics, Russia's $1.7 trillion economy looks to be actually in a better shape today than it has done for quite some time. Growth is slower, but more stable. A $124 billion so sovereign fund has actually been created, exporters have found new markets, and importers have found domestic alternatives. So much for Western sanctions and their intended goal, which has fallen short again. For Russia, the decline of Europe and the rise of Asia presents a historical opportunity. After COVID-19, the U.S. has seen that it's, well, moving downward in its economic output. And then you have the EU that's struggling. Its member countries really struggling economically in terms of their GDP output. In that respect, one wonders whether they even grew out of the European debt crisis. Why would Russia want to deal then with the U.S. and the EU uh, as the U.S. continues uh, to sanction it? along with the EU, while it has the opportunity to partner up with the economic powerhouse to soon take the economic reins away from the US, namely China. The East is further progressing, as it was evident with the formation of its biggest trading bloc in the world, namely the RCEP, that was eight years in the making. Some of the countries included there were South Korea, China, Australia, and of course, we could take a look at other uh, Southeast Asian countries. So it seems like the economies of the East is where Russia would benefit most, though it may still want to have minimal trade with some of the European countries that are willing to trade with Russia and not worry about the sanctions that have been imposed on it both by the EU and the US. Well, that does it for this edition of Economic Divide. We always enjoy having you on this program. Of course, we would enjoy it more if you added your thoughts do send them to us. Our email address is at the bottom of the page. From Mikavitagva, the entire team in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye.